Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to Good morning. How are we doing this morning? You doing good? Well, welcome to Vineyard, and I want to say a special welcome to everybody watching online. My name is Parker Mathias. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and I'm so excited to be speaking to you this morning. Uh, we have been in this series called Running with the Giants, right? We started it last week. We had a special guest, Pastor Chris. He opened up with the story of Noah. And this whole concept for this series, it comes from the book of Hebrews, okay? And, and in that book, in chapter 11, it basically describes these like hall of fame faith figures in the Bible and, and what they've done and what they've contributed. And then we get to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and in this verse, it says this, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And so basically, this verse is kind of saying, hey, since so many people have gone before us, right, both in the Bible and in our personal lives, they lived this life, they made some mistakes, they made some successes, but at the end of the day, their race is over and ours is still going on. So let us learn from them. Let us grow from their experiences and let us keep running our race. They finished it, which means it's possible, amen, and so we can do the same. You know, this weekend, we're talking about a heavy hitter, okay? We're talking about David. And I just want to say, you know, like, this is the David, you know, the King David, the David and Goliath David, the David and Bathsheba David, but we'll talk about that later, no spoilers. I do want to say, give me some grace, though, because the life of David is so long, it's so detailed throughout the Bible, and I could spend two months talking about him and not get it all. So give me some grace. I may skip through some of your favorite stories as I get to uh, the stories I think God wants to talk about today. But speaking of stories, our lives are filled with them, right? There's so many. Now, for me, every time I come up here, I feel like I always talk about food because I just love food, okay? <laughs> so much of my life revolves around food, my social life, my family life. It just, it's a great thing. But if you ask anybody that's close to me to describe my eating habits, they'll refer to me as something you may call a picky eater, okay? That is me. Um, and I think that I've gotten better in the past couple years, but it, it was so bad that like back in the day when my dad would take me through the McDonald's drive through in the morning to get breakfast, I would get one of two things. I'd get pancakes or I'd get biscuits, okay? And so if I got biscuits, he would order those biscuits. Hey, can I get two butter biscuits with some grape jelly on the side? He'd get it from the window. We'd pull away. He'd go to give it to me. And he would realize that instead of a plain biscuit, they gave him a sausage biscuit. He thought he was slick. So he would take off the sausage, right, and he would wrap it back in, and he'd say, here you go, here's your biscuit, and I would take it, I would put the jelly on it, and I would go to bite it. I would take a bite. Dad, there was a sausage on this biscuit. I know it. I'm not eating this. And he would get so mad at me. He would get so mad at me. It, it was so bad that it, it went to the point where he would have to go through the drive-thru and say, hey, I want the sausage, but you got to put it on the side. Like, don't put it on the actual biscuit. My son will know, and he won't eat it. You know, or another thing is, is I talk about Chick-fil-A all the time. I mean, I think it's God's food. I think he blessed it. He anointed it. There, there are no bad calories at Chick-fil-A. Um, and so it's amazing. But on the other hand, I've kind of shot myself in the foot. Because every time somebody wants to hang out with me, they're like, Pastor Park, we should get lunch. We should go get, grab food or something. I'm like, yeah, great. We'll go anywhere you want. They're like, let's go to Chick-fil-A. You know, sometimes I just want Chipotle. Sometimes I just want a nice salad from Panera. Why has it always got to be Chick-fil-A? And so stories kind of characterize our lives, right? The things that we experience, the things we go through, people often associate them, whether we like it or not, with us. 
And so I want to pose a question to you right up front throughout the course of my message. I want you to ask yourself, what do I want my story to tell? What do I want my story to tell? If I were to ask your best friends, your your co-workers, your classmates, your parents to describe and define the way you've lived your life, what would they say? See, we all have a race to run. And this race is going to tell a story not based on whether we win or lose, but based on how we run and how we finish. I think David's life tells us a story. It tells us one of triumph. It tells us one of victory, but also one of mistakes in sin. And I believe personally that you can learn from other people's mistakes without having to make them yourself. Amen. And we can also learn from people's victories. So I want to look at David's life, examine the way he lived, and learn from that. And I think if he could look at us today, if he could look at us today and he could say one thing, you know, to encourage us in this race that we're running, I think he would tell us this. He would say, hey, sit down, be humble. He would say, sit down, be humble. Now, for those of you who don't know, that is a song lyric, but I think it's so important because in every season, in all walks of life, in every moment, there's no greater, better seat to be sitting in than one of humility, than one of being humble. I mean, think about it, like, Being humble is lowering yourself in relation to others. But just because you put yourself at the bottom of the totem pole doesn't mean that you've stripped away your confidence or your authority. Amen? So, I mean, David's life is characterized by humility, characterized by honor, and characterized by security in God. And we're going to look at that today. We see it from the very beginning. Can I give you some backstory real quick? I just want to say, can I just say this real quick? I love participation. (laughs) I love when somebody says amen. I love when somebody says that's good. (laughs) So don't feel like you got to be quiet today. So the story of the people of Israel, it starts where we're going to start is God has freed them from Egypt, right? Brought them through the wilderness, you know, brought them through the Red Sea into the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. And they are settled there. It's great. It's going awesome. And then they start comparing themselves to other people. They start looking around at other nations and say, well, they have that God. Why don't we have that? And so they go to God and say, hey, we want a human king. We want a human. Everybody else has got one. We want one too. And I feel like God was like, well, I think I'm doing a pretty good job myself. I don't know about you. (laughs) But if you want one, then yeah, sure, I'll give you one. I'll tell you up front, though, it's going to break your heart. So the people still want the king. So God raises up King Saul, the first king of the Israelites. But he's not a man after God's own heart. He doesn't fully accept the promise that God has for Israel. And so uh, God sees this disobedience. He doesn't want to leave his people there. And so he says, I'm going to raise up a new king. And so he sends the prophet Samuel. And a prophet was just somebody who God would speak to, and then they would go speak to other people. And so Samuel goes to the king, and he says, you've dishonored God. He's displeased. And eventually your kingship is going to be taken away. And then Samuel is sent to this house of a man named Jesse, where he has several sons, the youngest of whom is our guy, David. So Samuel sees David, he anoints him as king, and he's probably 10, 11, 12 years old at this time. I mean, could you imagine being in middle school and somebody tells you you're going to be king one day? That's a lot of pressure. So he hasn't even taken biology yet, and this guy is going to be king one day. You see, he is not the king, but he is the king in waiting, so to speak, and and some time goes on. You know, could you imagine living your life knowing that you had this great promise on you, knowing there's this goal you're striving for, but you weren't there yet. You're kind of in this waiting period. Could you imagine that? Of course you can. (laughs) We've all got goals, right? We've all got desires that God puts in our hearts. We've all got things we want to achieve, and they just haven't happened yet. I mean, being in the waiting is hard, (laughs) I mean, maybe you feel like God has called you to to, to senior leadership in your company and you're just, it hasn't happened yet. That promotion hasn't come your way. God's telling you that you're supposed to continue education, but the money just ain't there, God, so I don't know what's going to happen. God is telling you you're not going to be single forever, but you look left, you look right, and no suitable partners in sight, and you're saying, God, why? (laughs) Sorry, that was a little personal for me. (laughs) Being in the waiting is the worst. (laughs) It's horrible. It's terrible because you acknowledge the fact that you're not where you used to be, but you're for sure as heck not where you want to be. And you're like, God, why can't you give it to me now? (laughs) See, there's no one who knows waiting quite like David does. I think if he could look at us in our waiting, he would say, sit down, be humble. 
But while you're being humble, I need you to know that you have to honor God in the waiting. And that's point number one on your outline today. Honor God in the waiting. Honor God in the waiting because you have no idea what is around the corner. You stop moving and you just say, I'm it, God, I'm done. But there's a promise right around the corner and you're missing out on it because you gave up. See, here's the thing. King Saul, he actually brings David closer to him. He has him play a, a stringed instrument for him because like the spirit came over him and, and he, he gets angry and depressed and he makes irrational decisions. So I pulled a picture from David's Instagram and this is it right here. Yeah, just kidding. But every time David would play for King Saul, the spirit would leave, the depression would go, the, the anger would leave, the irrational decisions he would make, it would just leave. So the current king brings the future king into service with him. I mean, you know what they say, right? Keep your friends close, but keep your what? Enemies closer. Except don't do that. That's a really bad idea. (laughs) So David, he would travel back and forth from the king to his father's house, where at his father's house, he tended sheep. That was his job. He was a shepherd. And so he was in the dirt, cleaning up their leftovers and um, all of that stuff. And that was his job, to tend those sheep. Now, some years have passed, and David is about 15 years old, okay? He's about 15 years old, and the Israelites are at war with these people called the Philistines, okay? And how they did battle is much different than what we do today. It was face-to-face, you know, know, it wasn't like from a distance or anything like that. And so they would line up and basically like shout at each other. And now you may, you know, I've heard this story before, but from the Philistine army, a giant steps forward. I mean, a monstrous warrior who was literally bred for this battle. I mean, they say that the Philistines probably gathered the tallest, strongest men, the tallest, strongest women, and boom, made him have a baby. And there was Goliath, the giant. And he steps forward and he shouts at the Israelites, at God's people. He says, hey, send me your strongest, most worthy warrior, and we'll battle it out one-on-one, man-on-man. And if I win, we take over you. But if, if you win, you've defeated us. He's basically saying, let's not waste time like with wasting all of these lives and this bloodshed. Let's just get it over one-on-one. This goes on for about 40 days. King Saul is nowhere to be found. <laughs> He's not answering this call. He's not stepping forward himself to fight for his country, to fight for his people. He hasn't nominated somebody to do so. And so David's father, he sends him down to the battlefield to bring supplies to his brothers who, who are in this war. And as he's, he's giving them the supplies, he overhears Goliath's speech, and he gets angry. I mean, he gets mad at the fact that the people are letting Goliath disrespect them and disrespect God. And so he goes to the king. Remember, he he has a relationship with him. And so he goes to the king Saul and he says, you've got to let me fight him. You've got to let me do this. Like, I, I, I can do it. You don't understand. I've got this. And King Saul looks at this young 15-year-old boy who's probably never seen battle in his life and says, no. <laughs> you crazy? <laughs> no. This is David's response. It says, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Okay. When a lion and a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it. I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. I want to ask you something. What in your life are you treating as a distraction, but God wants to use as preparation? What in your life are you saying is just wasting your time? It's no point in doing it, but God said, no, this will actually be a badge of honor on your shield when you go into battle to reach your promise. See, David was supposed to be king, right? I mean, isn't his life worth more than a thousand sheep? Why would he risk it fighting a lion and a bear? While prepping for this message, I was overwhelmed with the feeling that our lives are filled with things that we treat as distractions, as things that we think are only there to hurt us, and and it's just being rampaged by so many things that we assume have no value in our greater calling or purpose. People that don't respect us, people that don't believe in us, right? Right? A children that won't listen to you, a spouse that's not paying attention to you, a boss that hasn't given you a raise in three years. But God says this situation right here, 
This situation in front of you that you're tired of dealing with, that you think is only going to hold you back, this situation looks as big as a bear, sounds as loud as a lion, but I'm telling you it's only preparation for what I have for you. I'm telling you if you would just trust me in this, if you would just trust me in this, your blessings are coming your way. See, David didn't get lucky with Goliath. I hate when people say it's like an underdog story. No, David was prepared. David was experienced. They actually say that slingers were, were people who would actually, there was a, a form of them in battle. So David probably trained as a slinger. It wasn't some pebbles and a little string. No, that was a weapon. David was prepared for battle. He said, God, I'm not king yet. You haven't placed me over a nation yet, God, but you've trusted me with some sheep. And so I'm going to take care of those sheep because one day you're going to replace these sheep with the nation and I want you to honor and bless that too. What sheep in your life have you stopped paying attention to? God wants you to steward what you've got now because he's got something bigger for you later. But if you can't handle the little, how are you supposed to handle the lot? Ooh, I'm coming for the devil today. I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready to do this. When sheep are in your life, don't stop paying attention to them. Honor God in the waiting. Be proactive in the waiting. Be productive. Philippians says it like this. But one thing I do, forget what is behind, straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward to Christ Jesus. I'm not going to stop going because you don't believe in the purpose that God told me, not you. I'm not going to stop going because you don't respect my hustle that I've been through and the grind that I've been through because my purpose doesn't rest in you, it rests in God. Because if he spoke it, if God gave me a promise, then that means his only answer to that promise is yes, and my only response is amen. See, after this moment, the people, they fall in love with David. I mean, he killed the giant. This young kid, he killed a giant, and they just, yo, love him. And of course, Saul, this jealousy starts to build up inside of him. Saul brings him even closer, and he makes him his armor bearer. And then he even has David marry one of his daughters. You see, this then begins a long period of time where David is on the run. Because Saul gets so fed up that he wants to kill David. And so David hears of this and he flees and he's running from city to city and country to country and he's only about 25 years old when he runs away. Now this goes on for about five years. So David is, he's about 30 years old and he finds himself in a city called En Gedi or En Gedi, however you want to pronounce it. Saul gets wind that this is where David is resting and so he pursues him, he goes after him. But once Saul gets to the city, he gets tired of searching. They haven't found David yet. And so he tells his men, I need to go rest in this cave real quick. You guard it, uh, and I'm going to, you know, take a break. Funny story, David's in the same cave. <laughs> but he's just much further back. And so David and his men, they see this. They, they see Saul come in, and, and David's men, they kind of whisper to him. They're like, hey, this is your time, man. Take him out. And so his men, they said to him, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. What? <laughs> he comes back to his men. David doesn't actually kill him. And then he comes back to his men. And I kind of imagine that encounter like, hey, did you do it? David's like, no. <laughs> cut off his robe, though. <laughs> And they're like, man, we didn't ask you to give him a fashion statement. We told you to kill him. What's interesting is that, as I actually learned this the other day, is the, the piece of Saul's robe that David would have cut off most likely would have had a majestic seal on it, some type of kingship seal to signify who Saul was and his importance to the nation of Israel. Now, what's crazy is David, the way he responds to this, it convicted me. I read this, and it convicted me. And conviction is just God saying, this isn't the best that I have for you, and I'm calling you to a higher level of living. It's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. But this is what, what happens. It says, afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. David was upset at himself for cutting off the robe of a man who had been hunting him down and trying to kill him. He didn't do it, though we probably would all agree Saul deserved it. <laughs> if I was David, I probably wouldn't have stopped. But he gets so upset that he actually calls out to Saul and he says, Saul, it's your servant David. I just want you to let, I just need to let you know that I had this opportunity to kill you, but I didn't do it. 
I did cut off your robe, though, and this is proof that I, I could have killed you, but I didn't because I don't understand why you're pursuing me. I don't understand why you're trying to kill me. And in this moment, Saul realizes, he looks down, he sees that his royal seal has been cut off of his robe, that David has literally taken off the thing that signifies his kingship, but he didn't kill him. And so it's in that moment that Saul, he actually apologizes, he realizes, and he repents. Now, it doesn't last for long. That's not the point. <laughs> See, what we need to learn from David, and what I think David would tell us, is he would say, sit down and be humble. He would say, honor God in the waiting. But he would also say, humility is a position of power, not weakness. That's point number two. Humility, it's a position of power, not of weakness. The world tells us that we need to be louder, that we need to be the center of attention, that we've got to do whatever we can to make sure that other people like us, but it builds a false foundation of who we are. They say, dress this way, talk this way, listen to this type of music, hang out with only these type of people, and then you'll be cool. But then your self-perception, your self-worth, your, your, your capabilities is all limited based on what other people want you to do. So you need to know that your value as a person does not rest on how your boss sees you. Your value as a parent isn't based on what Becky from the PTA thinks about your brownies at the bake sale. Sorry, Becky's in the house. It's the first name I thought of. <laughs> your value as a student isn't based on the approval of your classmates. When we sit in a seat of humility, it allows us to recognize who we are. Then that's a child of God. And when we know who we are, we know what we're not. And when you know what you're not, you can allow other things to just get out your way because it has no point being in your life. David knew God didn't call him to be a murderer. David knew that God put Saul into power and that God would be the one to take him out. See, this year, this year has been one that has been very difficult for me, very difficult for my family. Uh, back in October, my, my great-grandma, my memma, she passed away. Uh, she's about 90 years old. And then, then last month in January, my nana, my grandmother, she passed away too. She's about 83. And uh, this is the first time in my life that I've had to grieve on a personal level. <laughs> it was the first time in my life that I've had to really witness my parents grieve on a personal level. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I'm very hard on myself, right? I, I tend to put these unrealistic expectations over me. I, I try to be what I think people need of me. You know, I put on a warrior face. I pioneer through the hard times, and, and you know, I just live life in the way that I think I'm supposed to. I mean, I'm a pastor, right? Like, I'm supposed to be the definition of strong faith. I'm supposed to be the definition of what it means to, to, to walk through these valley moments with your eyes fixed on God the whole time. I'm supposed to be happy and excited. And I'll be honest, I was angry. I was mad. I was mad at God. I was mad at myself. I was confused. I was broken. I didn't really understand why. You know, I had all of these emotions going on inside of me that for some reason, all my life as men in this culture, we're kind of taught that we can only experience two things, happiness and anger, and the rest has just got to go. And so I didn't really know what to do with all of this. I, I didn't know what to do with the fact that I didn't get to say goodbye, or, or I didn't have that one last moment, or I walked in a little bit too late, or I said no that one time when I should have said yes, and I, I was mad. <laughs> but here's the thing, church. Even though I pushed God away, even though I avoided spending time with him, even though I lied to my friends and said I was okay, even though all of that happened, God was still faithful. God was still faithful. And I'm still learning. I'm still grieving. I'm still trying to figure out what it's like to live this life and, and to walk this walk. And thankfully, they knew the Lord. And so I know right now they're rejoicing and celebrating right beside Jesus in heaven. But the thing is, to the outside world, I may have been strong. To the outside world, I may have looked a certain way, but inside I was broken and I was confused. But when my brokenness met God's perfection, I didn't feel ashamed. I didn't feel embarrassed. I didn't feel like I was weak or less than I was supposed to be. Matter of fact, I felt at peace. I felt humbled that the presence of God would come. Actually, I felt powerful. I felt powerful that the Holy Spirit would decide to use me in my brokenness would decide to call me to preach regardless of what I was going through, that would call me to speak to people's lives even though I had this doubt and this anger going on because God is faithful. When we are humbled by God, we are filled with his presence. 
When we sit in godly humility, our sin, our brokenness, our mistakes, they have no choice but to bow in the presence of who God is. And what's crazy is Saul does the same thing. Saul says this in response to David. He says, you have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. David humbles himself. He honors God. And then Saul had no choice but to uh, accept and to acknowledge the authenticity of David's kingship. See, when you are fighting something and you, you, you just need to humble yourself, and what is going on in your life that you're resisting, you're avoiding, you're putting it behind you, and God says, humble yourself. Do you always have to have the, the last word in the argument? Are your kids always crazy, or do maybe we need to take a second to listen to their experiences? Are your parents always mean, or, or have they just gone through some stuff and they're trying to keep you from going through some stuff too? You see... We need to humble ourselves before God. We need to sit down and we need to be humble. When we humble ourselves before God, we humble ourselves before his authority. When we humble ourselves before his authority, that means we're in the kingdom of God. We have have accepted that and we are a part of that. And that means everything that comes with the kingdom of God is ours. It is available to us. This is what it says in Romans. It says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children, Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, and heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, and if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. See, you are a child of God. The Bible says you are co-heirs with Christ. That means the same authority God gave Jesus on this earth has been given to you as well. The same power, the same grace, the same forgiveness, the same ability to reach people and to love on people has been given to you. It's funny because we'll have people come into our lives just like David did, right? And they'll tell us we're supposed to do something. You know, you're supposed to live this specific way. You're supposed to get back at them by saying this. You're supposed to uh, post this petty comment on their Instagram profile. You're supposed to say this behind their back uh, around the water cooler at work. But David knew, David knew that though his men had power in the army, the authority rested on him. David knew that at the end of the day, David was in charge of them, not the other way around. The only people that have authority in your life are God and you. You see, who in your life do you need to take charge of and say, no, that's not what God wants for me? There are people in your life and even the enemy whose job it is to undermine God's work, to undermine his purpose, to undermine the calling that you have in him. They try to speak things into you, but the truth is, is they have power, but no authority. The enemy has power, but no authority. And Jesus finished that on the cross for us. The only people, again, who have authority are you and your Father in heaven. You see, running doesn't stop. David continues to run from place to place, and, and he's kind of fleeing. And, and during this time, Israel is kind of like in turmoil. They're, they're at war with many different people. It's been divided into multiple kingdoms, and so it's not even one country anymore. And the prophet Samuel passes away. And then Saul passes away in battle just a day or so later. And it's at this moment that David actually takes the throne in Judah, which was like the southern kingdom of Israel. But it's not for about seven years, (laughs) seven years that David actually takes charge of the northern kingdom and unites all of Israel together. Now, he kind of basks in this, right? He's restructuring the government. He's, He's trying to build things back up. He has some children along the way. And then we fast forward 10 years later, 10 years. At this time, David is roughly 50 years old, maybe a a little bit more. And what happens is is they're at a time where they're at war again, defending the country. But David says, you know what? I'm going to hang back on this one. And then this is what we see happen. It says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out of the king's men and the whole Israelite army They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. 
I've come to realize that idle thoughts never produce anything productive. <laughs> Anytime I leave myself to my thoughts, I start getting mad at somebody that says something to me in third grade, and, and it just kind of gets this rabbit hole of me getting uh, embarrassed about something I said last week, and I should definitely not have said that. And then I'm just in my thoughts, and I get mad, or I get angry, and I get depressed, and that's kind of what happens. See, David does the same. He's not at war where he's supposed to be. He's not doing what he's supposed to do. So he wakes up one day. He looks out his window. He sees a beautiful woman, and he goes and he sends somebody to inquire about her, learns that she's married, doesn't care, brings her into his household. Bada bing, bada boom. We got a baby on our hands, everybody. We got a problem. David immediately goes into cover-up mode, right? He's immediately trying to figure this out. And how many of you know that when we tell a lie, we got to tell another lie to cover up that lie, and then that lie doesn't fill in all the gaps, so we got to say another one, and then we start forgetting about all the lies that we done told, and it just gets really confusing. And so David tries to do that. He brings Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, back from war and says, hey, man, I just want to give you some break, spend some time with your wife, have relations, I don't know. And uh, the plan fails, essentially. Because Uriah is worried about his fellow brothers who are at war, sleeping on the ground. And so he's so focused that he wants to go back. So David says, okay, that didn't work. You want to go back to war? Fine. I'll send you back, but I'll put you on the front line. And so David does that. And in the next battle, Uriah actually dies in battle. And so David thinks, well, problem solved. We're all good to go here. Wrong. God sees this. He's displeased. He actually sends another prophet, Nathan, to go tell David that he's messed up and that there's going to be consequences for his actions. See, David, once he kind of fully realizes the weight of the, the mistake that he made, he fully kind of embraces everything that just happened. He immediately goes into fasting and praying. He immediately turns back to God. He immediately says, Lord, I know I messed up, and I know I let this temporary feeling interrupt my eternal purpose in you, Lord, but I am sorry. But it's hard to get out of a bad mistake, right? Like, it's almost crippling sometimes. It's hard to repair a broken relationship. You know, I, I, I've made some poor decisions in my life. I made poor friendship decisions, relationship decisions, shoot, financial decisions, amen? It's hard to get out of debt. It's hard to forgive somebody who's hurt you. It's hard to live life when you feel like you've made so many regrets that you're afraid to even make another one. It's hard, but what you need to know is it's not impossible. David knew the decision was going to be hard to repair, but it wasn't impossible. And let me tell you something. In life, you don't always get to pick what happens to you. You just don't. You don't always get to pick the people that help you and the people that hurt you. The content of your story isn't always up to you. But I think what David would tell us in this moment, when we're frustrated at that, he would say, sit down, be humble, honor God in the waiting, right? Honor God in the waiting. Know that when you're humble, it's powerful. But also know when you get upset that you didn't get to pick what happens to you, know that you may not get to pick the content. But point number three, you get to choose the headline of your story. You get to choose the headline of your story. You ever heard of what clickbait? Anybody know what clickbait is? It's when you're online and you're searching for an article and, or, or a video to watch and the title says something like, you won't believe what this celebrity did. And you're like, oh, I got to find out what this person did. And you clicked on that link and they just are like a vegan now or something. It's just really a waste of time, honestly. But the title drew you in. And what I'm trying to say is, is that even though you have no idea what's around the corner in your life, which you can decide, the decision that is in your lap, the power that you hold in your life is that your story can either be one of where you are overcame by things or you overcome. Your, your story can be a redemptive one if you choose. Your story can be one of grace and forgiveness if you choose. So you messed up. You made a mistake. Someone hurts you. You failed to be the parent that you thought you would. You said you would never act like your father, but here you are saying the exact same thing that he said. It happened. And all you can do now is decide if this lion and this bear is going to defeat you or you're going to look at it and say, you're only preparing me to defeat the giant. Amen. See, I'm just saying, with God, your suffering's not in vain. <laughs> with God, your suffering leads you to the glory of the promise in heaven that he has for you. Mm. See, you choose your headline, and I say, let it be one of redemption. I say, let it be one of humility. Let it be one of power. Show the world that getting out of debt is possible. 
Show the world that women can lead just as much as men can. Show the world that God has called every race and every socioeconomic background to have an impact in this world today. Show them by running your race well. See, God sees David's repentance. He sees him searching. And now this doesn't take away our consequences, but it does change the way we live through them. And God says this, so David says, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replies, the Lord has taken away your sin and you are not going to die. You are not going to fail because the promise of God doesn't rest on you. If it rested on you, it would be weak, but it rests in something that's eternal that doesn't change and that can't be defeated. Your promise is secure. And just like I said earlier, if God spoke it to you, his only answer is yes. And our only response is amen. And if you don't believe me, Believe the prophet Isaiah when he, when he said, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud. Your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Stop running from God because you're afraid of what's going to happen to your sin. Stop running from God because you're afraid of how he's going to treat you. History shows us that he returns sin with love. History shows us that he returns mistakes with his son's life. History shows that he flips up what's meant to hurt us and he turns it into a blessing, into a badge. I love that David's life is a great reflection of who Jesus is, right? David defeats a giant. Jesus defeated the giant of sin. David overcomes adversity to unite a nation and Jesus overcame a culture, a religious mindset that was so toxic and he overcame that culture to reunite us with God. See, your story isn't over yet. Today's the day that we decide to live in humility. Today's the day that we decide to achieve and receive the power that God has for us. Today's the day that we know power through the Holy Spirit is in our grasp. Today's the day that we decide to be overcomers and not to be overcome. And I'm going to ask you this question one more time, but I've changed it a little bit. Because it's not about what you want. Let's take some action steps here. What is my story going to tell? What is it going to tell? My prayer each and every day is that when we wake up and we look into the eyes of the lion and the bear, that we merely see the promise of God. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Father, we ask for your presence in this place, Lord, to make it real. God, where there's doubt, I pray that you would come against that right now, Father. Make it tangible. Hmm. God, I thank you that you see our circumstances. Even now, there's people in here who are like, Pastor Parker, you have no idea. You have no idea the hurts that I've been through. But God does. God sees you. He sees you in the darkness. And he says, I've got light for you. He sees you in the pain. And he says, I've got healing and restoration for you. And so, Father, we thank you for who you are. God, and we ask that you would just help us humble ourselves before you because we know that our promise is secure in you, so it doesn't matter what others say. It only matters what you've called us to do. God, I thank you that through that we'll see redemption, that through that we'll see blessings. God, through that we'll see you move in our lives, in our families' lives, in our workplaces, Lord. I thank you for that. Hmm. Right now, I want to pray for anybody who feels distant from God. Anybody who maybe has never decided to give their life to Jesus as as Lord and Savior, decided to trust him for who he is, a man that existed in history, who came down from heaven to give up his life as a ransom for us, and not just to stay dead, but to be raised from dead to defeat our sin and mistakes. If you would like to receive that in your life, every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to count to three, and I'm just going to ask you to shoot your hand up. No, I'm not going to bring a spotlight on you. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I just want to know who I'm praying for. So if that's you, if you would like to trust your life with Jesus as Savior, if that's you, every head bowed, every eye closed, one, two, three, raise your hand. I see you. I see you. I see you. Father, you see these hands and you see these hearts. I want everyone to pray this prayer with me, either out loud or just in your heart is fine. Just say, Jesus, I know I've messed up. I know I've made mistakes. Today, I trust you. Today, I follow you. Make me new. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 
Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.